and uh, it's a pleasure to you know, be here uh, with such stalwarts of uh, our field. Um, are my slides visible? Yeah, perfect. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, dryer diagnosis and especially scenario related to our country and uh, certain uh, things as Dr. Raoul said, uh, uh, we'll critically evaluate uh, these technologies what uh, we have at our hand. I do not have any financial disclosure here. Epidemiologically, we have seen the dry eye is certainly uh, on rise and it's increasing across the globe. And uh, with the recent uh, studies published about Indian prevalence, uh, which is uh, as high as 40% to as low as even 18%, uh, which is a staggering amount of numbers of dry patients across uh, in such a huge country. If you put together, uh, it's, it's an it's a, it's a alarming amount uh, which uh, we, are, uh, we are sitting on in our country, especially with regards to dry air. So anything, whatever we uh, do, we have to keep in mind uh, whether the clinical implication of uh, such kind of thing, whether possibility of such kind of thing to implement in a large country like us is possible or not. Uh, Dues to give uh, the latest definition of uh, dry eye, and which which is uh, as we know, which is multifactorial uh, disease. But in definition, there are certain factors which are very important, and I've highlighted them here. As one of them is hyperosmolarity, second is apoptosis, third is inflammation, and fourth is TFM instability. These are the four main pillar of pathogenesis of uh, dry eye. Whenever I want to treat any disease. If we know the pathogenesis, well, we can treat the disease more efficiently because all we have to do is tackle these things uh, individually and you can actually uh, uh, treat the disease. So for the diagnosis purpose also, whenever we tackle the diagnosis, we will keep in mind that these are the things which we have to possibly address. Classification-wise, whether it's due to or it's an Asia Cornea Society, ultimately we end up classifying dry eye into aqueous deficient mix and evaporative dry eye. If it's an Asia Cornea Society, again, it's similar like aqueous deficient dry eye, increase evaporation and decrease wettability of dry eye. These things uh, the next speaker would elaborate upon. Uh, the diagnostic approach wise uh, used to uh, told us that uh, one, we have a triage questions which uh, which involves uh, many things uh, like the discomfort and uh, about the dry mouth whether so uh, once the triage questions leads us uh, to the dry uh, patient uh, we start with the diagnostic test here and i'm uh, limiting myself to the diagnostic part here so uh, According to Deuce 2, uh, apart from all the different different questionnaires, two questionnaires which are uh, more exhaustive and relevant uh, was DEQ5 uh, questionnaire and OSDI questionnaire, where the score is more than uh, 6 for DEQ and more than 13 for uh, OSDI, which is significant. In the test part, they suggested uh, we should have non-invasive TFM breakup time, osmolarity, and ocular surface staining. And we'll take these things one by one. The dry questionnaires are absolutely simple and lately many of us have started using, using OSDI questionnaire. And I certainly feel that uh, this is uh, very relevant uh, irrespective of whichever country we live in. Uh, questionnaire does not uh, cost you much and uh, we must start using questionnaire. Uh, the two uh, things happen. One, uh, it documents the subjective uh, discomfort part of the patient and helps you to follow up the patient correctly and third it it brings some uniformity in uh, the doc diagnosis uh, part or the documentation of the symptom part so uh, it's very important we stick to uh, the questionnaire now coming to the diagnostic tools we have clinical diagnostic tools like fluorescence staining rose bengal lissamine green tear from breakup time shermer's test and so and so forth these are the commonest uh, used across especially in our country and then we have device or instrument-based diagnostic tools like mevography, non-invasive breakup time, lipid flow, um, lip, lipid view, I'm sorry, uh, MMP9, osmolarity, many of these things. 
the next speakers next couple of talks they're going to talk about the clinical diagnostic parts i'm not touching that part but we'll restrict ourselves to the these device or you know, instrument based diagnostic and we'll critically evaluate them whether it's worth in our country so before we start that again we go back to the pathogenesis and we are sticking to the pathogenic uh, component of the dry and one of them most important is hyperosmolarity there are plenty of literature out there which shows the effect of hyperosmolarity on dry and we know that uh, higher the uh, osmolarity more will be the damage to the dry i mean to the ocular surface but interestingly if you look at the data the variability or intertest variability of uh, such kind of thing is very high and if you look at the curve in normal versus dry eye there's a huge uh, uh, crossover between that that means you can have cases which are normal and you can have abnormal values of the test or same way you can have a dry eye case but still can have a normal value so looking at all these things uh, very high variability and very high expense involved of the machine as well as uh, uh, the consumable um, it's a little difficult to implement in our country also if we look at uh, dry versus uh, normal or mild to severe disease uh, there are publication which shows it can be same the values can be similar whether it's shogren versus normal versus non shogren the values can be similar similarly what if we diagnose and if we find that the hyperosmolarity is there does it help us in treatment well uh, studies on hypoosmotic solution prove that even if you put in a hypoosmotic solution on the ocular surface within a minute or two the osmolarity level will come back to the uh, before uh, that level so it does not help so overall if i look at the test these are the question i ask myself that does it help me in diagnosis this certainly does not does it help me to decide about the severity of disease well can't say that because we 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 saw that uh, even severe disease can have a normal value does it help in treatment not exactly even though it tells me that a higher osmolarity is uh, severe dry eye does it have good repeatability no does it have good sensitivity specificity no does it have good value for money no so in that case possibly this is not uh, the test which i would like to use so even though due to tells us to use osmolarity as one of the very important uh, feature i don't think it's very relevant in our country to use uh, this thing coming to the next part inflammation uh, part the inflammation and dry eye has been studied a lot and we know that it's sort of a white inflammation it may not show the congestion uh, there is one uh, test uh, for the mmp9 level which is uh, commercially available in country in our country uh, though it's uh, not very easy to procure it but it's certainly not uh, uh, not uh, like not reachable to most of us uh, it's a very simple test and when we uh, when we do the test it tells us if the mmp9 level is more than 40 nanogram per ml if the mmp9 level is high that means it's a significant inflammation on the ocular surface and patient would need uh, anti inflammatory molecules like cyclosporin topical steroid or tacrolimus or if the mmp9 level is less then possibly the lubricants may be good enough uh if we again look at the same questions uh, which we earlier saw well does it help in diagnosis equivocal i can't say that uh, very significantly does it help in decide about severity of disease again very equivocal about the treatment and everything value for money it looks like it's more of equivocal so it's a low priority if you have it you certainly can use it but i don't think i would stress upon this thing as my main stay of treatment coming to the next part which is tfm instability part and which is a very important chunk of dry eye which we deal with and that's the neuroperative part of the dry eye there are a lot of uh, improvement in the treatment uh, here especially thermal pulsation uh, and like lippy flow and ilux device and many such devices are there in the market which uh, which helps us to treat these mgd more efficiently now but when we come to diagnosis there's one important diagnostic uh, uh, test which uh, i would like to mention here is mebography 
in the mebography we image the mebomin glands of upper lid and lower lid and as you can see from the picture uh, here we can see these vertical comb shape uh, distribution of mebomin glands in normal case and on the right side you see significant loss of mebomin glands in abnormal cases why is it important well we know that in case of mgd uh, the mainstay of treatment has to be warm compresses lid massage or you know, the treatment protocols like uh, clipiflor or ilux and such kind of uh, newer uh, treatment devices but what if we do a mebography and find that uh, mebomin glands are normal well this is going to be fine but if the mebomin glands are not normal if they are absent whatever we do like this kind of thing it's not going to work so it's extremely important whenever we are utilizing such higher end uh, devices to treat mgd to confirm if there is significant loss of mebomin glands and hence uh, uh, there can uh, there cannot be any uh, lesser role of mebography in such kind of uh, cases so mebography according to me is must now what in our country mebomin gland imaging is difficult well i have been doing mebography for very long time before even the machines were available on my auto refractometer so any uh, device which uh, emits uh, suitable infrared uh, um, range you can actually use it uh, to image your mebomin glands so uh, i don't think we can uh, claim that availability of uh, uh, mebographer can be issue however uh, if we look at the again same question i Uh, it actually ticks all the boxes it helps us in diagnosis it helps us in severity of disease it's repeatable it's a very good sensitivity specificity and certainly value for money and i would certainly say that a mebography is must in our country when we are treating the dry eye there are certain devices which are a comprehensive dry eye diagnostic devices like one of them is keratograph im uh another is ocular surface analyzer and there are few other you know, also there in the market and they they can work beautifully well in the clinics so uh, like uh, uh, keratographer can do topography and also can do mebography non invasivity of him break up time it can do interferometry and lipid layer analysis the tear meniscus measurement pupillometry white to white measurement redness score and it can take diffuse picture also ocular surface analyzer along with uh, this thing uh, does not have uh, <clears throat> a topographer but can uh, can be quite mobile and handheld and can help you with the blepharitis uh, assessment also so such kind of devices can bring certainly huge amount of value to our uh, diagnosis another uh, dry diagnosis related to the uh, you know tear film instability is lipi view which is uh, interferometry based analysis of lipid layer and which uh, which also tells us about the lid dynamics and blinking dynamics uh, it's certainly very beautiful machine and uh, gives you very nice interpretation of lipid layer but if you look at uh, the limitation it has poor repeatability poor correlation with sign symptom does not guide us about the treatment or need of treatment uh, more of a costly machine to study blinking pattern so if we again go through the same uh, uh, list uh, does it help us in diagnosis no does it help to decide about severity no does it help in treatment of course not good repeatability no value for money no so i don't think i would be very keen on investing on this thing so what are challenges when we come to our country in busy opds all of us we find same thing that uh, time consuming test uh, many time uh, you know, things which we have to do uh, we do not uh, have time to do or we we may not have a reliability of uh, usage of that test uh there are a lot of overlaps between normal abnormal and also the diagnosis of dry eye has become more instrument dependent and uh, lack of uh, correlation between sign and symptom so according to me the dry eye diagnostic in our country the gold standard should be symptom uh, questionnaire ocular surface staining uh, tear film break up time shermer's test and mebography finally i close with uh, these questions that can dry eye diagnosis be further simplify than keeping it uh, more elite and uh, uh, keeping it for more specialized uh, people only because this problem is much more pronounced than what we think 
do we need simpler method of assessing dry because getting more and more instrument we are getting more and more dependent on instrument are there ways which we can use a simple technique or few simple techniques in our outpatient to possibly detect the dry more efficiently with this thing uh, i would uh, uh, conclude and my future speakers would take up the queue from here thank you very much